You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. It does all come down to relationship. It comes down to the dog's association. Does the does the dog find listening to you, working with you as a team? Does the dog find that reinforcing? And I think, you know, when, when you've created those, that real nice foundation relationship where the dog's out with you and the dog's you know the dog recognizes that this is a team a team effort um not the dog just doing its own thing and you hindering it um is that then that you know you have a dog who is willing to work for you and willing to listen to you and i think you know um it's very easy to communicate with them then with regards to what we want and what we don't want and i think you know you don't have to be hard on them and you don't have to come down on them the dog completely understands yeah that wasn't what i wanted Hey bird dog babes, my name is Courtney Bastion and I am obsessed with all things bird dogs and I'm here with you to share the stories, experiences, knowledge and opinions from the women and a few guys in the industry that are killing it. I'm a Wisconsin girl living in a Montana world, I'm mom and two incredible kiddos, wife and occasional assistant to a pro gun dog trainer traveling the U.S. talking about canine nutrition while hunting, breeding, and competing with my German wire hair pointers and Bracco Italianos. As someone who started hunting later in life because I wanted to give my dogs the opportunity to do what they were bred to do, I'm here to help inspire, educate, and connect women to get their bird dogs out in the field and experience a bond like no other. So pour yourself a glass of wine and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Bird Dog Babe Podcast. I think the majority of you that have been out hunting this season can relate to having dogs with sore paws. And now that the snow is here for some of us, it brings a whole new element to the issue. Will boots help in the snow or in the desert? If so, what kind? What's the best way to treat sore red paws or missing pads? On Thursday, November 5th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Dr. Meg of On Point Veterinary Services will join me and my Patreon patrons live to discuss all things regarding bird dog paw care. We'll talk prevention, maintenance, and treatment. To register, go to patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe. My guest today is Jane Ardern. Jane is the owner and head trainer at Wagawuffins Canine College in the UK. She uses positive reinforcement for all obedience and gun dog training. Her methods mean more than just clickers and treats, and she gets into that in this episode. Jane also discusses how she makes gun dog training feasible while living within city limits. And being she is a breeder of Cocker Spaniels, you know I was excited to hear more about the breed from her perspective. All right, let's get after it. Thank you to sponsor Dakota 283, unparalleled protection for traveling to and from your favorite hunting spot. Dakota 283 kennels are a premium quality roto mold with recessed handles on top for convenient and safe tie down and makes it easy to lift up into the truck. I love the secure door frame with high security locks so I know my dogs are safe when I need to stop for fuel. An added bonus is the drain hole in the back which makes cleaning a breeze when your dog has been run hard and put away wet. Head over to dakota283.com and use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for a 10% discount. Thanks to sponsor Excel Shooting Sports, elite dealer of Cesar Guarini, Fab Arm, and Siren Shotguns. Siren is the world's only full line of shotguns created for the female competitor, hunter, and shotgun enthusiast. Excel is one of only four demo centers west of the Mississippi. They give you the opportunity to actually try out a gun before you walk out the door with it. As an elite dealer for Caesar Guarini, Excel offers their customers unlimited pit stops of free service and tune-ups on all shotguns. A great way to have your gun in top condition for the upcoming hunting or target season. In addition, they're offering an exclusive deal to all of the Bird Dog Babe listeners for a free gun slip with each purchase, a $90 value. All right. Good morning, Jane, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Well, I guess it's afternoon for you. It's morning for me. It is, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I wanted to have you on. Um, I've actually been looking, searching actively for you person <laughs> for, <laughs> for quite a while here because, well, first of all, I'm so intrigued with the Cocker Spaniel breed in general. Um, I've been over to the UK on a couple different trips and I love watching those dogs work. And you specifically as a female gun dog trainer and yeah. the reputation that you hold is really, really outstanding. And so I'm anxious to have this conversation with you. Um, but yeah, so if you could tell us a little bit about your journey and, and how you got started in dog training in general. Okay, so um, I've always had dogs. I've always been interested in dog training. Um, my first dog was actually a rescue St. Bernard Cross Rottweiler um, who had some quite serious aggression problems, especially towards people. Um, and he kind of took me on the start of a journey because I think it was really trying to understand him and understand what was going on. So he kind of was the driving force behind me getting interested in dog training and dog behavior. Um, from then on, I went to, I, I had Liam Burgers for 20 years. Oh, wow. um, and I did some showing with them, some water rescue work, bit of obedience, had a little play around with working trials. Um, and that really kind of got me into dog training. Um, and eventually I'd done some courses and set up some puppy classes, um, just as a hobby really, and uh, kind of part time. And then it kind of just slowly took over my life. Um, as I got more and more into training, I ended up going to university, doing a degree in dog training and behaviour. Um, I also studied with COPE, the Centre of Applied Petathology, um, which is which is in the UK. Um, and then because I'd kind of got into training, um, Liam Burgers are lovely dogs, but they just don't have that oomph about them. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and I always say to people, I spent I spent 20 years trying to motivate Liam Burgers and finally accepted my breed limitations and bought myself a little working <laughs> cocker spaniel. <laughs> what a jump. I mean, our, <laughs> to get Liam Burgers even treat motivated is a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I decided I wanted something that was up for the training as much as I was. So I got myself this little working cocker spaniel and um in the uk we have working cockers and we have show cockers mm -hmm. um and they are literally like two different breeds of dog mm -hmm. um and i was because i was doing a lot of behavior work i was seeing a lot of show cockers for aggression and resource guarding mm -hmm. um, and really kind of seeing the worst of them so when i had started to fall in love with the working type cockers um, I was really kind of quite specific that I didn't want um, one with show breeding because of what I was seeing at the time. Um, so I decided that if I bought one with a, pedig a little red pedigree full of field trial champions, <laughs> then I definitely knew it wasn't show lines. Right. So I ended up buying this red hot field trial <laughs> bread, <laughs> little chocolate cocker spaniel, um, who um taught me a lot um and she was actually fantastic i live in the middle of the city and we were doing just general training with her we were doing some tricks some obedience um and she was absolutely fantastic and then i decided that i'd have a little dabble in this gun dog training malarkey and um she was introduced to game and i went home with a very different dog <laughs> as um as her instincts were awakened. Um, and yeah, I made a lot of mistakes with her and I went on quite a journey learning how to kind of um, harness that drive back in, understanding drive, understanding arousal and instinct. Um, and just the sheer determination of these little things. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what was also challenging for me is there wasn't um, positive 
positive gun dog training was quite limited um, within the UK at the time and it was quite challenging for me to then find some support um, with somebody who kind of had the same mindset and ethos with regards to training um, and I did manage to find that and we did manage to steady her up um, and I worked her for four seasons hmm. um, so that's kind of where the journey started and then I got another and another and another and now I have six <laughs> <laughs> They're a great little breed. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So what made you want to dive into that portion of trying to field stuff with your first one? So I think because um because I, I think we was I mean we was dabbling in heel work to music of all things to uh <laughs> um with her. And I think from doing water rescue with my Liam Burgers and seeing how different a dog is when you when you're doing what it was bred to do and you're tapping into working with its natural instinct I was really quite interested in kind of you know seeing where that went um living in the city it's something that we have very limited exposure to here <laughs> right. um it's very much a countryside pursuit in the UK um, and not something um, people kind of so not something that you see or people even understand that live in the city. So how so, are you getting yeah. your exposure to birds then when you're living in town? So a lot of time, a lot of the time, it involves us going on training days, mm -hmm. and um, in my local park we have uh, we have plenty of vermin, so we have plenty of pigeons and rabbits. <laughs> Um, so, so we can do an element of exposure, but most of it was limited to, um, to, to specific training days where we could go out and do that work. And one of the trainers that I did work with initially with Pickles, she was my first cocker, um, he had, um, homing pigeons. So we did quite a bit of work with his homing pigeons to steady her up because she was, she was absolutely steady as a rock on dummies. Um, I could go and do a display with her, you know, at some, at some summer fate, um, and she would be absolutely brilliant, but put something with fur and feather and a heartbeat in front of her, and she was a very different dog. You know, I think, I think this is a, a common um, concern that people have that do live in a city setting that have dogs that they want to either train and or hunt with. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the ways that you were able to get over those obstacles of living in a city and still, I mean, not, not just the bird exposure, but, but all the other things that go with that, the conditioning, the exercise, uh, getting them used to the different kinds of working terrains that they will be eventually hunting on. So, so where I am in Manchester, although I am kind of 10 minutes from one of the biggest cities in the UK, we do actually have a lot of green space um, with regards to kind of woodland and fields. And there's not particularly lots of um, kind of farmland and livestock, but it's more kind of um, protected woodland um, mm. and kind of open spaces that, people, that, that you're free to go. So it's a little bit of a blessing, really, because... Um, we, there is an awful lot of green space and land to to take the dogs to and train. There just isn't there isn't much kind of um, wildlife as such there. Okay. Um, and uh, and would you say that most of your foundations are done right at home, anyhow, regardless of where people live? Absolutely. Um, I find that from from a from with my young dogs one of the main things for me is that they're confident to explore the environment as little hunting dogs so one of the things I'll do is just gradually introduce them to different environments and just make sure that they're comfortable and confident with different environments and start to kind of increase the challenge such as how how, how thick the cover is and heavy the cover is um, that they're comfortable with water um, going over water going through water um, and then from a from a steadiness point of view, I do lots and lots of impulse control around movement. And I work really, really hard to generalize um, that steadiness to movement. 
so then when they get to the day that they flush their first pheasant they just think it's some other crazy thing that i've <laughs> added to the training scenario <laughs> okay yeah that's interesting um, that they need to be steady with so i do work on a lot of generalizations so when we do get to that point um of exposure that it, it is just something else so what are the some of the ways that you're mimicking that um impulse and arousal around them so i um i start with um working on auto sits so having a dog who will offer sits and choose to offer sits because they get rewarded and then what i start to do is actually introduce movement as a cue to the auto sit so we start off with um kind of simple basic movements such as that might be that i drop some food or i drop a toy on the floor and then i'll build up to that i throw it then i'll vary how i throw it um and then i will start to introduce um things like what they call the bolting rabbit which is a rabbit fur dummy on a bungee cord hmm. wow yeah. um so that so that introduces speed and and low to the ground movement we then um, use something called the flirt pole or the whip it, um, which really is just a horse's lunge whip with a toy on the end. So again, what you can do is, is introduce movement. Um, and then what I'll also do with that is start to, I have a really long horse's lunge whip. And what I'll actually do is put a fur or a feather dummy um, into, the into the ground. I'll hunt the dog over the ground and then I can flick that up just to simulate that flush in the environment as well are you training um a lot of other gun dog breeds as well or mainly just the flushers so i mostly do spaniels um but i do have some different breeds i have had um plenty of labradors come um and also some H hpr breeds as well okay and HPR, so uh, there, that's hunt point retrieve. So that's uh, for our listeners here because we have different terms. Yes. <laughs> I've, yes. I've caught on over the years. Yeah, so <laughs> the HPR is uh, what we would call like our versatile pointing breeds here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, yeah. So over there, you guys do with your HPRs, um, you have the dog, the dogs are going on point mm -hmm. and then you're having them sit is that what you're calling an auto sit so with the with the spaniels the spaniels would sit to flush so they kind of just yeah. bump the birds up and they flush so with a um with a hpr they would point um and then they would go in and flush and then they should stop once they're flush so we would do the auto sit after the flush Right. So they sit after the flush. So, so the handler, when the dog's on point, the handler is then giving the command to get in, right? Yes. That means, that means yes. flush. And yes. as soon as that bird flushes, then the pointing dog sits um, yes. until they are released then to go retrieve after the bird's been shot. Yeah. So it's different here. So here we, the dog is on point and they have to remain standing through um wing shot and fall and then oh, they're sent so we don't it, we 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 the hunter the handler um flushes the bird ah. and yeah so so it's different and we had uh we had a dog come over here that was uh four years old and very very well trained by my uh, good friend una russell and he he was very hard to break from that sitting after the flush <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> which which in one of our systems in navdo is okay but uh he was going for his master hunter in a different system and they're like he just sat after the bird got up so he's out <laughs> uh. <laughs> so it's it's hard to you know to it, do that different kind of training when they've been taught that as initially as puppies and she was she's such a good trainer yeah, so yeah, yeah a little and bit different yeah and i use um so so if the dogs were um what we call rough shooting so if the spaniels were were hunting fluff, flushing and retrieving then um we would want them to sit on the flush um mm -hmm. my dogs often work on a shoot just purely as a beating dog and then the retrievers will be they're working the wood to find the birds and then the retrievers will be outside 
of the wood and they'll do the retrieving of any of the shot game so so when we're working in that scenario they don't even have to stop on flush they just have to flush and hunt and flush and hunt and flush and hunt so again mm -hmm. and my dogs kind of learn in that environment that they don't have to keep stopping every time they flush that they just need to not chase the bird uh, but what they need to do is is hunt on straight away to find some more right right and to be honest i like uh the way you guys do it over there better with the dog um flushing the bird because they're the ones that know exactly where that bird is at and yes. you know here we are a lot of times looking really stupid kicking around all this brush because you don't know where the dog's nose is if they're two feet yeah. off the bird or if they're 20 feet off the bird and yeah. <laughs> so it gets a little interesting <laughs> when you're kicking around and then you know, you, you can't find the bird and you're asking the dog to move on. So it's, I like how you guys do it. And I just think there's so much more control there with having, having that flush right in their face and then them Im immediately sitting and having that control before they're sent for the retrieve. It's, it's yeah. a yeah. beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you finding to be um, like one of the most difficult things training wise with these dogs that are so um they're bred to be such full-on gun dogs how are yeah. you gaining that control over there um like you and i discussed a little bit earlier of the heavy use of e-collars here in the u.s and um, i don't even think they're allowed over by you are they um, yeah, um, I um, I worked on one shoot. The ver first shoot I worked on, mine was the only spaniel that wasn't wearing one. <laughs> mm. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah. So so there is there is some e collar use. I would say that it's not um, it's it's quite limited. Mm. Um, it's not something you would you would see often, um, but it does it 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 does occur. Um, there's a real kind of mix of, of methods and approaches and I come from a positive background from my obedience training background anyway so when I decided to do gun dog training that was obviously how I wanted to do that as well um, and I do you know I do say to people it, it's sometimes it's kind of new ground that we're walking on um, and it's quite different sometimes we have to think outside of the box and get creative there isn't always a manual <laughs> out there to help us find solutions um, for me it's really really important that if you're training positively that you really really understand motivation and that you also really really understand reinforcement and and not just reinforcement that you're providing but also the reinforcement that the environment <laughs> Um, provides for the dog as well and making sure that you can control and manage that so the dog to set the dog up for success um, I think really teaching impulse control and having a dog who enjoys impulse control for me it's not about rewarding with toys and treats it's about conditioning real positive emotion to the control behaviors you want so your dog then does choose to do them okay so are you saying that when you are getting a marked behavior from them, you're not doing a clicker and a treat to reward that every time? So when I'm, when I'm working on real kind of foundation stuff, I do use clickers and treats and clickers and toys. I also use a verbal marker. Um, I really do mix my rewards up as well. So I do use a lot of praise um, and tactile contact. A lot of spaniels are quite touchy-feely dogs um, mm -hmm. and kind of genetically selected to be quite into people. Um, so they often do find um, tactile contact reinforcing and they also find um, just kind of conversation and verbal praise reinforcing as well. So I really do like to mix up the rewards so the dog doesn't always expect a specific kind of reward. I'm very big into using a marker, whether that's a clicker or a verbal marker from me, because I think timing is really key. And so when they're, when you're working them on a shoot, so you guys, again, different verbiage. So you use shoot and that the dogs are beating in the field. Yes. Right. Can you, I'm sorry, can you describe uh, a little bit what a shoot would look like? 
so and what the beating um, is so it's quite um the way things are set up in the uk are quite quite different so you can have small little farm shoots which are just kind of local people from the village get together and have a day out <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and everybody has a role um two really kind of big commercial shoots as well where there's lots of birds and lots of money involved as well so it really kind of does vary so so the beating that i do is just local farm shoots where they'll just you know they might kind of rear maybe um kind of you know a couple of thousand pheasants on there and and then once a fortnight they'll go um, and have a day of shooting so you normally you'll have you'll have your beaters who are the people who go through the wood and the cover to flush the birds up into the air and then you'll also have the guns and then you'll also have dogs that are picking up as well so normally you'll have beating dogs who are the flushing dogs and then you'll have the picking up dogs which are the retrieving dogs and um, so they're often separate because you may go into a wood and the guns and the picking up dogs will be outside of the wood on the open field on the open crop fields and um, waiting for the birds to come to be flushed out of the wood okay so you you don't typically have somebody who is a gun and the dog handler is the same person um so so that can happen so we class that as rough shooting okay so that's classed as rough shooting um which i've done a little bit with um with friends where we've 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 just gone out um and he's he's worked his dog and he's just you usually kind of just work up hedges Mm -hmm. when we've done rough shooting okay i've been to a field trial for the hprs and and i don't know if you can tell me if it's the same with spaniels and with a shoot in general but um you're letting one dog go at a time to work a field, a portion of the field, while the other dogs are in a heel position um, on a lead walking with and until it's their turn. Is that how you're, is that how you're doing it? Yeah. So, so with Spaniels on a field trial, um, they have, um, they'll have the dogs who are waiting their turn. So yeah, they'll kind of be further back with their dogs on lead um and what they do with spaniels is they work two dogs at the same time side by side Mm -hmm. um and then they'll usually have a judge for each dog as well um and then what happens is one gets a flush and then the other has to demonstrate its kind of steadiness to wait while that participates in what it needs to do um and then they do their bit and then they'll go to the back and then some more dogs will come through. So in Spaniels, they do work two dogs at a time. Okay. So how on earth are you keeping teaching how to keep those dogs calm when they're in that line, knowing that it's going to be their turn soon? Yeah. And they, they know exactly what's going on and watching the other dogs get to work. How are they, they what are, are you doing there? Um, so, so they are quite far back, to be fair. I mm. did, I went and I was a game carrier at a trial, um, which is a great way to learn because you're right behind the judge and the dogs. <laughs> um, but you have to carry all the shot birds. Um, but it's a great way from from a learning point of view because you're really quite close up so the dogs are quite far back um the trial that i went on was quite interesting i think there was 20 cockers entered and 10 of them were eliminated um mostly because of noise oh just walking (laughs) along Um, that was when they were working and i just wondered whether the the noise was them letting off the steam that they'd built up (laughs) right (laughs) right waiting their turn yeah absolutely Absolutely. so can they be disqualified while just in the line as well though for making too much noise only only when only only while they're they're actually working okay by the judge i think if your dog was making noise while it was waiting its turn um I'm, they'd probably do something about that okay <laughs> it's, it's it's just it's, so it's, different noise is infectious isn't it <laughs> oh yeah yeah they get <laughs> they get stirred up but yeah. so are you do you ever give them like a settling command something that is just kind of like you don't need to sit you don't need to lay down but you just need to keep calm 
Yeah, so what, what I tend to do with men, and this is, you know, I, I do this a lot with um, kind of a lot of pet owners as well with work, who've got working dogs in pet homes um, and also people who are training, is, and especially from a positive point of view as well, um, is really understanding um, kind of arousal and the, the differences. So with, um, with my dogs from a training point of view is I'll teach them um a settle and relaxation cue which is really kind of a nothing's happening mm -hmm. um you can probably just you know catch up on a bit of sleep <laughs> lie down and um, nothing's going to happen at all so it's it's a real kind of relaxation cue and then what i'll also work on as well is um what i class as controlled anticipation so that's where the dog is in a state of arousal because it's anticipating that something exciting is going to happen and then it's about how they how they manage themselves during during that point um one of the mistakes i made with um well the mistake i made with pickles was she went into a complete state of over arousal <laughs> Um, and was really kind of just every time you took her in that environment, she was just completely fired up. Um, so when I got Stig, my second cocker, is I worked an awful lot on um, on keeping him calm, getting him to settle. The first time I took him on a shoot, we actually just walked behind the beating line and we did heel work. And then we did settling between the drives. Um, and the mistake I made with him was that although we went into that environment and he was he was calm and well behaved and really, really good, um, because he wasn't in a heightened state of arousal, he wouldn't get in the cover because it hurt. Um, mm. Because I'd actually managed his adrenaline levels. <laughs> right, right. Um, and he actually started to squeak out of frustration. So if he knew, knew a bird was in the cover um he would get frustrated because he'd want to go in and flush it but he wouldn't because he could feel the pain of, of especially getting in the tight brambles um so that was a real big learning curve for me because where i thought i'd solved one problem i'd actually created myself another um and that really taught me about understanding that that especially with the little spaniels they need to be in a state of anticipation they need to be in a state of arousal there needs to be a little bit of adrenaline going there but they also need to be controlling themselves as well. Mm -hmm. What kind of cue are you giving them for that settle? So, so from a relaxation, I usually just give um, a, I'll usually just give a, a settle cue. Okay. Um, and you're just from, saying that word. Yeah. Just, just telling them that they need to settle. Um, when I'm working in um, from a controlled anticipation point of view, um, I actually teach because uh, a lot of spaniels are usually sitting around and waiting. Um, so I teach what I call anticipatory stillness and I actually don't give that a verbal cue at all um, is I teach the dog that if it offers me that controlled stillness, then it gets to hunt, it gets to retrieve, it gets to do all the things that it wants. So I use it as a way of something that they can offer me um, in order for them to get what they want. So it's very much a choice-based behavior. And often the environment just triggers them to offer that behavior to me. Um, I don't know, you know, we've discussed this a lot and I don't know whether, because it is very much a state of arousal, whether it's something that I could just verbally cue to happen it seems like such a really difficult um great area of of sending them you know into a settle to okay now go ahead and hunt um when you're yes. doing that like are you using place boards where because you have multiple dogs so yes. are you putting them yeah. all in like one position and then they have to sit and watch a different dogs work yeah so so part of the part of what they will do is often usually sitting sitting and waiting around um and that's usually the part that they struggle with um so i do lots of um pairing stillness with movement knowing that for spaniels that movement is motivating for them so movement's their motivation that's what they love to do so we do lots of um pairing stillness with movement so from a 
kind of dog training science point of view, we'd actually class that as pre-MAC, okay. which is where you pair something less reinforcing with something more reinforcing to make the thing that's less reinforcing more reinforcing. Mm. Um, it's also known as grandma's rule, which is if you, if you eat your tea, you get your pudding. So the way I look at it <laughs> with the spaniels is that stillness is their tea and uh, movement is the pudding. <laughs> right. Um, so so i kind of incorporate that into into part of the, the the kind of training sequence so they learn that it's a part of the fun stuff that they do so even when i'm just out and about with my dog sometimes they'll just come and sit in front of me so i'll release them because it's fun to be mm -hmm. released mm -hmm. um so it builds up kind of arousal anticipation but it also helps the dog learn how to control themselves okay when they're in that state of arousal okay so when you're giving a dog a correction what what are you doing if that dog if you just told him to sit and it leaves what are you doing as correcting that from you know if, you, if you're a positive reinforcement trainer there's got to be some negative reinforcement as well right so if yeah so if i have a if, if i have asked a dog to do a sit and a stay and they decide to just get up and move um i would just put them back okay um, you're not you're not giving them a verbal like ah, I would, or... uh, sometimes i might chuck a ah, ah, in mm -hmm. <laughs> um and i will just if the dog's off lead i would just pop the lead back on i would just bring the dog back in um and and i would just start i would just start my training exercise again i would expect once i get to the point where the dog's in the field that that we haven't got those kind of errors occurring mm -hmm. because the dog's suitably trained if um i always say to people it, it's you know a, a lot of people think um if you're a positive reinforcement trainer that we kind of like ignore ignore the bad um, and what we have to recognize, especially with your working gum dogs, is, is what we perceive as the bad, which is the dog not doing what we want. They're usually reinforcing themselves with the environment, such as hunting and sniffing. And therefore, you know, if they decide that they don't want to stay and they want to go off and sniff, then they're actually giving themselves a dopamine rush as a consequence of that. So it's really important for me that um, when I withhold reinforcement, it's not just reinforcement from me that I will withhold reinforcement that the environment may potentially give up, give the dog as well, especially for not listening to me. So, um, so I would just go and bring the dog back in and make sure they don't just go off and do their own thing. And I think, I think the biggest part of, of that and having that focus and connection is primarily having that initial bond with your dog. And I think a lot of times, I mean, do you agree that because we own a dog doesn't necessarily mean that we are bonded with the dog and, yes. Yes. and have laid that foundation? Cause I'm sure you get, you know, people and you hold training classes where yeah. they're telling their dog to sit and it's like, no, <laughs> yeah no. absolutely and and i yeah. do think you know i do think for me um it it does all come down to relationship it comes down to the dog's association does the does the dog find listening to you working with you as a team does the dog find that reinforcing and i think you know when when you've created those that real nice foundation relationship where the dog's out with you and the dog's you know the dog recognizes that this is a team a team effort <laughs> mm -hmm. um not the dog just doing its own thing and you hindering it um is that then the you know you have a dog who is willing to work for you and willing to listen to you and i think you know um it's very easy to communicate with them then with regards to what we want and what we don't want and i think you know you don't have to be hard on them and you don't have to come down on them the dog completely understands yeah that wasn't what i wanted what's your feelings on you know any more you almost hear the term fur baby. Do you guys hear that over there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and cause we love our dogs, right? But, but yeah. there's this, there's this line of um, that the fur baby mentality of they, they can kind of get away with whatever they want or I love them. I'm going to teach them. They're going to be my hunting dog, but really uh, you don't have much control over them because you don't, 
you don't want to tell them they're wrong or you haven't done or, or you know done anything that's upset you. So yeah, do you think that that mentality is is causing an issue? I think um, what's interesting is is at one point when I was training is I would often see a lot of dogs um, who were kind of. Um, I've been trained through correction um, and there was lots of relationship problems, fear, anxiety coming from the dog, relationship towards the owners. And I'm definitely now seeing more and more dogs who have been who are being trained positively, um, but also outclass us very permissively as well. So, yeah, I think people are frightened of saying no or stopping the dog from something or even just doing something about the fact mm. that the dog's doing something inappropriate. Um, and I think it's yeah I'm not I'm not a big fan of the term fur baby I love my dogs to bits but there are dogs mm -hmm. and and I respect them and treat them like dogs you know mm -hmm. that's that's what they are they're a, they're a different species to us they think differently they work differently um, and for me it's about building a relationship where you know where they respect me hopefully and I respect them for for for, for what they are um so yeah i do think um i think with regards to kind of approaches and training methods i think there there are extremes on on both sides <laughs> right which are not helpful to dogs mm -hmm. and with that comes a structure in the household um like what does what does the structure in your household look like jane are they are they crated when they're not being worked? Are they crated through the night? Do you put the food in the crates or are they sleeping in the bed, sleeping on the couch? Um, so, kind of have... so I, um, so I have kennels outside, which have just got storage. Okay. <laughs> Stuff in them. Um, so the dogs all live in the house. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes if they're absolutely filthy, when they come back from a walk, they'll get popped in the kennels. But um mm -hmm especially now i'm especially with the amount of dog theft in the uk i absolutely would not be comfortable with leaving my dogs in kennels anyway outside right, right. um so the dogs the dogs live in the house they have the kitchen and dining area um sometimes they're allowed in the living room area um, but there's strict rules about what they do when they're in there because that's my space um i have um i have crates for the boys um, the girls sleep on their raised beds, the boys go in the crates. And the reason why I do that is because when um, when one of the bitches comes in season, um, the boys obviously have to be separated and crated. So I think if that's their life all the time, um, it doesn't kind of create any additional stress <laughs> to them during during that stage when they've got bitches in season. Right. Um, when I feed them, um, they're just fed in the kitchen. They have their own spots where they eat their food. Um, so they all eat in the same room together, but they all have their own bowls and their own food. Um, and again, I have very specific human rules in the house that you don't, you know, my dogs can all have chews and raw bones together. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'm very strict about the rules that I have that you can't go and steal something off somebody else um, and once you've got it it's yours you can keep it unless the human wants it <laughs> then the rules change right. um, so yeah I have you know we we have structure in the house um, and I think you know for me when we're training dogs regardless of what we want to do with them from a sport or activity point of view um, the dog's overall mindset with regards to life is so, so important. And I absolutely don't think you could have a dog who does absolutely what it likes in the house and causes chaos and then expect to have some element of high control when you're outside in the field. For me, I think it's about how the dog sees life overall and what its mindset is to, you know, that when I ask you to do something, something happens <laughs> mm -hmm. um so so i'm quite consistent across the board with the dogs in general because i think that's really important so what does your feeding time look like are you are you having them all sit and then you're putting the bowls down and then giving them the okay to go eat or um, no so i just we, we just have names so i just kind of stick a bowl down say a name head goes in stick a bowl down they're all usually just waiting <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So when you have a, when you bring a new puppy in that d- ha- does it have manners yet and is going around to everybody's food bowls, how are you correcting that? So, so the puppy is initially fed separately um, from the other dogs, and then what I will start to do is is incorporate feeding the puppy um, with the other dogs. Um, and what I'll use what I've got at the moment is um, I have a, um, a baby gate which splits up the kitchen. So the puppy is currently eats his food with two of the other dogs who will growl at it if it comes near the food bowl. So it's learned not to Mm. steal food. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's very clever. (laughs) And it's the ones who are the ones who are nice about it. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, (laughs) exactly. The the happy medium dogs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I do think when you you know when you have good dogs. Um, I think they're absolutely fantastic teachers when you have new puppies. They're so much better at than we are, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Right. No, you're exactly right. So you're regarded as a puppy training specialist. So what what exactly is it that you think would be the key with puppy training? What do you do when you get them at, say, eight to ten weeks old? What are you starting right away? So with me, I think um, with puppies, it's really just it, it's simply learning about life um, and being able to to live in our world um, and to be able to cope with with the pressure that we potentially put on dogs these days, um, that they're socially competent, that they're resilient. I think dogs need to develop resilience. It's really important. Life's not easy when you're living in the human world. Um, and yeah, I think really just socialization, just coping with life. Um, and I often work on real, for me, the, the important stuff is that you're building a relationship based around trust, um, and feelings of safety. Um, so the dog's happy and comfortable to be with you. If the dog struggles with anything in life, then it's kind of going to come to you for support, um, as opposed to run off frightened um so yeah for me it's really kind of just just foundation skills learning about life learning about manners learning to control your impulses um so with from a gun dog point of view behaviors that i work on really is that the dog can be off lead that it stays close to me checks in with me um that it can retrieve and that i can it will bring things to me and let me have things <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, so especially with cockers that there's no resource guarding going on that they're quite happy to relinquish objects to me so for me that's the real I think the real foundation stuff um, I've got a puppy at the moment who's 21 weeks um, and people have said to me you know you know what have you taught her and I'm like you know she's just she's just learning about life she's learning to eat with five other dogs <laughs> right right um, she's learning to go out be off lead stay close to me explore the environment be confident with it meet lots of people meet lots of dogs Um, she can't always you know she can't always have what she wants in life as well that's always the challenging part for a cocker <laughs> mm-hmm. what are you doing um gun introductions with them so um i'm quite a noisy person <laughs> Um, anyway, I'm quite a noisy okay. person anyway. So I do, I just make sure that they're exposed to lots of generalized noise. Um, when I have, when I have a litter myself, I do lots of noisy stuff with the litter. Um, so I would expect, you know, during food time, I'll feed them outside on the concrete. We'll chuck the metal bowls up and down the concrete while they're eating um so i'll also do quite a bit of startle and recover i find that um it's kind of really popular people are like oh you know if we want to desensitize dogs to this we need to do systematic desensitization and counter conditioning and i find a lot of problems that i see have occurred actually from a startle response and i think it doesn't matter how much you expose an animal to something sometimes you will startle them it's just it's just a normal 
you know part of of what happens and often dogs don't recover from startle responses so i like to do a little bit of that as well so if something does spook or worry and we usually play and have fun um and counter condition the startle response as well um i remember when i had my last litter of puppy three years ago um i did a lot of noise and sound stuff with them we kind of just played shoots off youtube as well in the house when they were like five six weeks old as well it was on the tv um um so so introduced it just gunshot as a general sound on the tv um and i remember one of my puppy owners had actually said to me that they um i think they tried to interrupt their puppy from doing something inappropriate with an ah uh -uh, or clapping hands and they actually um couldn't interrupt behavior with noise because it wasn't bothered mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so i was like we'll be we'll be fine when we get to gunshot so yeah with puppies i think again i think it goes to just generalize generalization of noise um, okay. so it doesn't again living in the city we don't have a lot of exposure but i can expose them to noise in general um, mm -hmm. and we do have youtube <laughs> <laughs> so that helps <laughs> yeah 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 so a little earlier you had talked about <clears throat> excuse me the difference between like the show bred and field bred dogs um when when your average pet owner is or maybe even uh, somebody that is only going to hunt their dogs a couple times a year. So, mm -hmm. um, and they're going, they're looking for a breeder that hunts themselves and, you know, so they know that they're going to produce that. But the problem of having too much dog in an average household um, yeah. type situation, what are, what are some key points for that? On, on helping them out and, and understanding what the, things that they can do with that dog. Um, Cause it's not only physical exercise. I think a lot of time it's the mental exercise that they're missing out and the dogs just get to be too much for them. Yeah. I think a lot of the, a lot of the spaniels I see is, is what often happens is, is they actually get over exercised. So people give them kind of high arousal physical exercise to tire them out. Um, and usually they just put them on an adrenaline rush that they can't come down from. Um, and then what happens is they bring them home and the dog's still running around the house um, like crazy. And then they assume they've not exercised it enough um, when actually it's just struggling to, to kind of come down from the adrenaline rush it's been put on. And then they exercise more. Um, and then what happens is they often end up just turning them into these athletes that need five hours exercise every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I really do um, emphasize to people that it's about mental stimulation, that they can play scent work games with them. Um, there's ways you can get gun dogs to use their noses. That doesn't involve hunting. Um, so in the UK, scent, just scent work in general is really, really popular. And there's lots of different organizations and activities that you can do, which which Spaniels definitely really, really kind of excel at. So I often advise people that um, they want to participate in, in alternative scent work based activities to provide the mental stimulation that the dog needs. Um, I also think working on scent work is better at relationship building. Um, because you're kind of tapping into what the dogs are all about and what they're naturally very good at as well so i think when you're doing scent work as a team especially for a cocker is always going to be much more reinforcing than than doing obedience for example okay go into a little bit about the scent work and and what you mean by that so you have a are you taking random articles and essentially teaching them how to find it yeah so what we often do with with the pet dogs is we um we choose a scent we usually use um i usually use catnip or sage or oregano which is just it's something that's easy for the owner to access um and we just sent up dog toys and then work on them finding them and um just making the searches more challenging and interesting for the dogs okay um what about tracking are you doing tracking with with any of the dogs in training 
So when I did um, some working trial training with Mali and Burgers, we learned um, shut some tracking um, with the group I was in, which was which was really the Lee and Burgers were very good at it. Um, <laughs> something they were motivated by. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my! <laughs> just walk, yeah, walking along a track with their nose on the floor. They loved it. Um, so what I found with my spaniel is, is or what I found with my spaniels personally um, is because when I've got them outside in the environment and I've released them off to search because they're doing their kind of figure of eight or with a cocker sometimes it's a little more of a star shaped <laughs> um, hunting pattern that they do so it's a very busy fast moving hunting pattern um, I actually tried some tracking with a friend um with one of my cockers um and he just got massively he sent his frustration right through the roof mm. um i think just the fact that he was on a lead he had to slow down he had to do a straight line it just went completely against everything that i'd ever taught him from a hunting point of view mm. um and he and he found that very difficult um and I know sometimes when we've done some of the pet dog type scent work, they do searches like search dogs do, um, where they work perimeters of buildings and so on. Um, and I found one of mine finds that quite frustrating. So even when we do that, I still hunt them up for their furry toys in, in, in still in the same hunting pattern I would if I was beating through a wood. Okay. So, and you hold a specific... Um classes like workshops of gun dog training so what are some of the things that you're teaching in that class so the majority of the dogs that come through to the class they're usually pet dog owners who um, just want to do some stuff with their gun dog tap into their instincts understand it a little bit bit better and then have a couple of people who do do some who do do some working on local shoots with their dogs as well um, so really in that we work on um kind of basic steadiness retrieving directional control um teaching them to hunt in a controlled manner to cover a certain area we teach the stop whistle um and yeah being able to work around other dogs and ignore them <laughs> mm -hmm. what age um, typically are you getting them in at so because um because the training that we do is positive um i think the earliest one ones i've had start are kind of like 14 weeks old okay okay um and we just and again we just keep it fun um and just getting them to do some nice simple puppy retrieves and um, getting them to stay connected with their owner off leave so really just um building up those foundations um if we think about um neuroscience and neuron firing and building habits then you know the puppy's brain is is the plasticity is, is at its best at that age as well so for me i really like to kind of form those habits from the start um of of the real important foundation stuff that we want from them okay let's get in a little bit uh, deeper to the cocker spaniel breed itself because yeah. i'm so intrigued with them <laughs> <laughs> which uh what are the some of the biggest challenges in training that breed specifically i think um i think for me is their um is their frustration tolerance um is you often find that they really struggle with with tolerating frustration so when thing when they can't have what they want or things don't go their own way um they can they can often find that quite challenging um i think that as as a as a breed they are bred to be persistent and they're bred not to quit um mm. to be a good hunting dog and to take on any terrain that's in front of you to find those birds you need to be persistent you need to have a little drive and you need to um to not quit easily as well and often what you find with these dogs is is if they learn the wrong thing um they will also be equally persistent <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and not quit um with regards to inappropriate behaviors the other thing i find as well is is 
you know they're 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 prone to ocd repetitive type behaviors and i think they can easily obsess and become quite addicted to certain behavior patterns um my goal is that that that's the hunting pattern <laughs> okay um often what can happen is that obsession can manifest itself differently if the dog's allowed to go and get a dopamine rush of its of its own accord and mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the dogs that i see especially the pet dogs is you know the owner lets them off lead and the dog just goes hunting on its own um, and they've they've just missed that foundation and that bond with them yeah and it's you know i'm like really you should be it's recognizing again i spoke before about understanding reinforcement and understanding that when you know every time your spaniel has its nose in the ground it's getting a dopamine rush so what you want to do is is tap into that and make sure the dog learns that it's you and the dog that do that together and it, then it gets the dopamine rush as opposed to the dog learning it can source out its own reinforcement mm -hmm. while it's on its own mm -hmm. <laughs> without you right as and so essentially one of their biggest challenges can be turned into one of their greatest features of the breed if you can yeah channel and that's, that's what you know i often say to people that you know the problems that people have are usually they stem from the very specific genetic traits that we breed for the dog to be a good working dog what are some um tips for finding a, a good breeder and i don't it's hard to say the words good breeder <laughs> right but <laughs> it's so wide open but i mean as somebody that would like to get one for hunting um knowing that they can be an overdrive or that they might not be enough do you have any tips on how to find a good breeder think, for that um I think with with cocker spaniels in the UK, what what you do find is is even with within the working cockers, is you'll have your strong field trial bred dogs who are kind of field trial champions, field trial champion, and they'll have a you know a big red pedigree, and um, and it's always recognising that you know those dogs those dogs are hot, they're fast, they're going to have a lot of drive, but equally you know they've been successful in competition, so equally they're trainable, as well um but they are they are dogs that have a lot of drive and you need to understand how to harness that there are then um and those dogs are often they're often fast and they're often very stylish as well so they're really eye-catching because that's what helps them win competition so you know mm -hmm. they kind of you see those dogs working and they 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 catch your eye because they look so good when that when they're doing their job and then you have um what i would kind of call gamekeeper bred so these are the dogs that i mentioned about was on the local shoot so the gamekeeper who looks after the birds on that shoot and um, will have his dogs and he'll breed those to his friends dogs who work on the shoot and these are the dogs where they're not quite as hot and stylish um, but they're the dogs who can work for six hours seven hours through the day and they can keep their head but they also have their stamina um, and then there are some spaniels who've just that there are people in the UK breeding them purely for agility um, and they're taking no um, kind of they're not taken into account through their just genetic selection whether they'd be actually any good as a as a working gun dog um, so for me it, it's a lot about looking um, looking at the pedigree and the lines and deciding what you want from from your dog um and then and yeah and then finding a breeder that's that's gonna um spend some time with the litter as well and obviously recognizing what what happens in the first eight weeks of their life too right um, right and i think it's a difficult balance because for me i think you know the most important thing is that the genetics are there so do we want to be looking for field trial champions throughout each generation or do we want to see maybe a little bit intermittently yeah so i think um it, it's really about um you know i think if you if you want to do field trials and you want to win then you would definitely mm -hmm. be looking for <laughs> something with a big red pedigree because okay. you know they're they're the dogs that are winning 
Um, I think if you're looking for um, an all round working dog that you can go out and, and work regularly through, um, you know, through the season, if you've, you know, some people work their dog five, six days a week throughout the shooting season. So there you, you don't want something that's, that's kind of hot and fast and going to burn out quickly. Okay. What about health issues? What, what kind of health issue and clearances should we be looking for that breeders are doing? So we have um, in the UK, there's um, DNA tests. The most common DNA tests are um, AMS, which is um, acral mutilation syndrome, um, which is um, it's a neurological disease where they um, they get irritation in their paws and their pads, um, but they also don't have any feeling there either. So they end up chewing them to the point that they have to they damage themselves so severely they have to be put to sleep oh, often wow. mm. um, and that's appeared recently in Cox in the UK but there is a DNA test for it okay. um, it's a recessive gene so what you found was when people started to breed closely with certain lines it it, it, it appeared um, there's also some eye problems so there's DNA tests that you can do for those um we do annual bvai tests as well um which is where they just look at the dog the dog's eye as it is on that day um to check for any problems and um hips and elbows scoring is not hugely common in the uk in working cockers but it is starting to um become more and more um common which is good i do have mm. a cocker with hip dysplasia okay um so it is something that, that that occurs within the breed how i mean being a smaller breed how much does that really affect them so i think um i think the thing is 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 people don't hip score um so they don't really know what they've got and we have to remember that these are a breed of dog that are designed to work through pain. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to take into account that um, with a working cocker, especially a hot little drivey one, then poor hips might not be that identifiable because they will just keep going okay. regardless. Right. Uh, which is part and parcel of what they are. So, um, yeah. And if you want a dog who can work all day, he, he needs good hips. Mm -hmm. And what about, are there any patella or cruciate issues? Yeah, so patellas are something which seems to have appeared recently, um, but it does seem to be um, in the smaller cockers. They, they vary quite a lot in size. Um, so you I did notice that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so, what breed is that? What breed is that? And they just yeah. kept saying, it's a, it's a cocker. <laughs> Yeah, so some of them are tiny. They're kind of like eight, nine kilos. Um, yeah. And then um, you've got others. I mean, mine mine kind of range from about 12 kilos up to 17. Okay. Um, yeah. So they're not... So um, different. Yeah, so... And, and I kind of like mine the size that they are. I just think they're a good size. They can, you know, they can easily pick a, a big... Um, pheasant cock bird up if they needed to if there was if there was um, I'm sure they could retrieve goose if that was required um, so it's important to me that they can comfortably pick large birds up as well okay so I do like the size but I have seen some of these tiny little things <laughs> with sheer determination pick up right but yeah the patella seem to be appearing in the smaller dog so I don't know whether that's occurred through um, breeding smaller cockers. Hmm. So what what uh, happened recently that you um, posted this really awesome photo on Facebook <laughs> of you out training um, that someone had said, um, was it about being a woman dog trainer? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think it, I think it was on YouTube. It was um, it was a, the, <laughs> some marketing guy was telling um, that dog trainers needed to 
um, not be so sexy as it will put customers off, especially high end paying customers or something. Um, so we kind of had a little gig giggle about this. So a few years, it was five years ago, that photograph. And it was, um, oh. we did a um, charity calendar um, and it was a field sports charity calendar called High Lost My Clothes. <laughs> um where where yeah we 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 all got um naked in a calendar girls kind of way um and that's we raised awesome. money we raised money for hounds for heroes <laughs> that's awesome it's so oh, there yeah. was a different theme for each month like you were the dog trainer and then there yeah was so so i think there was um there was there was some horses there was some lurchers <laughs> there was some um birds of prey um yeah there was a mix there was some fishing going on um yeah so there was something different and then the calendar was double-sided so for each month you could either there was either a, a semi-naked man or a semi-naked woman <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so, so you could choose um so yeah so that was that was obviously we did that on a with a it was done with a field sports theme they did it for about five years running i think um, and then stopped but yeah it was for hounds for heroes oh, very neat and you were just to share some of your accolades but you were the kennel club um accredited trainer of the year yeah so in 2015 i think it was um mm -hmm. i won kennel club dog trainer of the year which That's was amazing. um you were nominated by your customers and then you everybody the people who were nominated went in front of a panel at the kennel club where the five finalists um were announced um and then it went to public vote so it, it was a bit like britain's got talent or the x factor <laughs> <laughs> very cool and you're a lecturer at um university as well aren't you so I was, um, when I finished my degree, I did my uh, Bachelor of Science in Canine Behaviour and Training um, and I had, I had scored the, I'd got the highest score in the advanced instructing module. Um, so they asked me would I go back and teach? So I went back for three years um, and taught their organising classes and instructing modules on the degree um and then i went on to teach for cope they um had a second year behavior course so i did their practical modules uh run their practical modules for them for three years um and now we have our own in-house um instructor course which we do for people who are starting out and want to be dog trainers and you do that through the wega Wuffins canine college yeah 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 nice um and what about a, a book did you come out with the book recently so the book um <laughs> was so i was approached by the publishers um mm -hmm. and they asked me to they asked me would i be interested in writing a book um and that was three years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it took me three years to write it um i'm actually dyslexic and i'm not very good at writing at all so that was a real personal yeah. challenge that i took on um oh, for sure and i was kind of quite pleased that there was a um the publishers were involved because they could kind of support with editing and so on mm -hmm. um with the content so yeah that took me took me three years to uh, to write that and that was released it was launched at crufts this year in march that's awesome what's it called jane so it's called Mission Control, How to Train the High Drive Dog. Um, and it's it's really kind of full of a lot of the impulse control stuff that I teach. So it's, although it's kind of for all, well, any high drive dog, there's, it, it's, I talk a lot about my Spaniels and gun dogs in there as well. So it is a very, very relevant book to people who have got gun dogs or doing gun dog training as well. Okay. Um, where's the best place for us to find that to purchase it in the US? So, so um, in the US is Dogwise. It's on okay. Dogwise. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll put the link to that in the show notes as well for people to go to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate thank your you. 
your time and your wisdom and insight <laughs> today. It was amazing. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something from the content, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on whichever platform you're listening from. Check out the show notes for links to references from this episode, as well as info on how to connect through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're loving this podcast and want to support the production and content, please consider becoming one of my Patreon patrons. Being a patron connects us more on a personal level where I'm able to help answer questions and give advice. My husband William and I have bred, owned, and trained AKC Master Hunters, Field Champions, NAVDA VCs, and AKC Show Champions. We're excited to not only share what we've learned, but also listen from previous and future episode guests for additional content. Go to patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe and $5 per month and you're in. Through the Patreon platform, 5% is donated towards conservation and an additional 5% is donated to the AKC Canine Health Foundation. Until next week, bird dog babes, keep them versatile.